For those who know me, or simply those who are interested, I consider Australia an amazing land, continent, nation. Unlike any other country in the world, Australia has its own history, people, monuments, movies, and national symbols, far beyond from the mere stereotypes that we see on television, even though some of them are pretty dated. I know that the debate of national identity is still complex, but despite this, Australia has its own fantastic histories, histories that are so incredible to be real, histories that indeed can be a great inspiration for many horror or fantasy movies, just like Wolf Creek, and are, can be even better than the creepypastas that we see on the web. I know that Australia, or at least I want to invite, no, I want to invite you that, to remember that Australia before 1788 had at least 600 Aboriginal communities. And even though some of these traditions are, ha, have been rescued for the past of the years, there are still a lot of, of histories done under that enrich the history and mythology of Australia. I have read some of these stories and I wish I could share them with you today in this video, but I know that's impossible. So what I'm gonna do is just um, get three of these stories and share with you tonight. For now it's gonna be paranormal or mysterious identities. But don't worry, it's not a horror video, it's just an anthology. Or it is? Anyway, please enjoy three amazing stories from Australia. On Campbell Town, located at 50 kilometers from Sydney, the farm McFerry Fisher born in London, 1792, managed his farm like a normal person. Fisher came to Australia as part of a 14-year sentence of transportation in July 1816. Once in Australia, Fisher had a big variety of jobs, from superintendent of the Waterloo Floor Company to managing clerk in New South Wales. It wasn't until 1822, six years after his sentence, when Fisher purchased enough acres to get his own farm. The business apparently went good. Fisher even got George Worrell to be his attorney, or so rough. But suddenly, on a cold evening of June 1826, Fisher disappeared, never to return again. Gone without a trace, leaving no clue that could explain his sudden disappearance. Three weeks later, Worrell sold all of Fisher's properties, but he was um, arrested shortly, after, shortly on the suspicions of murder. Four months after Fisher vanished, a local resident, John Farley, stumbled into a Campbell Hotel, shaking and pale to his very bones. Farley claimed that he saw the unthinkable. He claimed that he saw the ghost of Farrick Fisher. According to Farley, the ghost of Fisher was sitting on a rock near to a bridge, pointing with his big finger at a paddock. Then, all of a sudden, it disappeared. Again. Shortly, police was sent to investigate the same paddock the ghost and allegedly pointed. To their shock, they found the body of Frederick Fisher. Farley's amazing tale was not allowed to be used as evidence against George Worrell, but he, sh shaken, terrified and possibly guilt ridden, confessed that he was the master band behind the murder of Frederick Fisher, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. After that, Frederick Fisher was buried on the St. Peter's Anglican Church, again at Campbelltown. Despite this, many people still claim that his ghost is still out there, roaming on the outskirts of Campbelltown. Perhaps he's still there, perhaps not, but how can we be absolutely certain of that? Every single year, Sydney organizes the festival of Fisher's Ghost, in remembrance of the lady. We should give, I think we should give credit to the police, whose reluctance to reveal the ghost story might contribute to the rise of this incredible, chilling anecdote. Fisher's ghost, ladies and gentlemen.
What you just heard was the bloop, the sound from the 1997 Creature, located on the southern part of the Pacific Ocean, apparently near to Riley, the hometown of the Lovecraftian monster Cthulhu. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, between the world-renowned Loch Ness monster, Cassiendieta, and perhaps Ogopogo. By the time you hear this story, you will be as confused as I am right now. We have to go back to New South Wales, to the Hawkesbury River, or Dirubun for the Aboriginals, which surrounds west and north of Sydney. This river, one of the longest of NSW, comprises at least 8,346 square miles, at least 2,200 kilometers, and it is connected to other equally big rivers, including the Nipian River, which compresses um, 178 kilometers, the Brisbane Water, 165 square kilometers, and practically ending up in Broken Bay, which technically leads again to the Pacific Ocean. Hawkesbury River is a pillar of the fishing industry of New South Wales, is too, giving almost six million dollars per year to the state. The truth is that the Hawks Bay River is ginormous and vital to many fishers. Fishers that suddenly have mysteriously disappeared. And here is where we get our first assumptions. Around Hawkesbury River, many people have claimed to have seen a 35-foot aquatic monster, which is resembled a dinosaur. The interesting part is that these sightings have been appearing even before the colonization of Australia, where many aboriginals, presumably the Darkinjung or the Kuringai, claim that they have seen this creature that has been attacking women and children in this area. They name the creature Holy Wong and also Mireula. Here is, here is how their names are written. There was nothing to be surprised. Just like I said, the Hawkesbury River is an important source of fish for the locals. That's inter what's interesting is that both Aboriginals and white Australians have agreed in two things regarding this creature. The first one is that they name it the Hawkesbury River Monster. The second one, the creature resembles a plesiosaurus, which is not a surprise, mentioning that many bystanders also claim that the Loch Ness Monster resembles a plesiosaurus too. Now, keep in mind that at least one of the indigenous tribes that I just mentioned, in this case the Kuringai, has lived in Australia for at least 1000 years. So you can't possibly imagine that um, the Kuringai have seen this creature since practically their very first generation. Or at least, or at least many, many, many centuries beyond. So, based on this, you can imagine that the Hawkesbury River monster is more antique than you could possibly think. Of course, the Plesiosaurus became extinct approximately 65 million years ago, but like the Cordyceps fungi in The Last of Us, there are still many mysteries from nature itself. So what this was this cars that one of these ginormous monsters is alive somewhere in New South Wales? Hmm? Be as it may be, many people chasing this creature. One of them, Australian renowned naturalist Rex Wilroy, has been looking for the Hawkesbury monster since 1965. 1965, almost 50 years. Now that's why I call discipline. Be as it may be, Gilroy has admitted that looking for this creature is incredibly difficult, that it requires patience and a pretty obsessed wallet. But he, along with his family, will continue looking for the monster for the years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, Australia's Loch Ness Monster, the Hawks River Monster. Kuira is a small town in New South Wales, located at 547 kilometers from Sydney, that is also 349 miles. 
place for the old Aboriginal tribe or the Gumbai Nigir. That's how it's written. Don't get confused, please. And the Anai one, who first named the town Gilgoel, which simply means swamp on the Yukamba language. What is now Guira, white cockatoo or, simp or fishing place in Anai one, was founded in 1835 by Alexander Campbell and immediately became, began a process of expansion and industrialization that lasted five decades during the 19th century, becoming rich in the mineral and in the cattle industries. Ever since then, Guira became a relatively peaceful town away from the harassment of the press. Of course, until the Where is my daddy issue in 1960. Aside from that, Guira always enjoyed prosperity. But one day, that peace was disrupted once more. Guira has a dam that supplies the town with water. This dam was built between the 1950s and the 1960s, becoming one of the town's most significant buildings so far. On December 6, 1999, the Guira dam was suddenly hit by an object, forcing the dam to be shut down temporarily to an enormous spot of mud that went into the water. That definitely looked like either an accident or mere vandalism, in my opinion. But that was not the only odd thing. What was really weird is that apparently what damaged the dam came from outer space. After the impact, this object flattened the ridge of the dam in an area of at least 15 meters. Mud was everywhere. However, oddly enough, nowhere near Guira hear any explosion whatsoever. It is it was because of a local impology. No one will ever know the, the incident. Not even the police. And once again, that's nothing compared to what happened next on the town. Police came to see the object, but still they they couldn't find any idea what this thing was. An UFO, a meteorite blue eyes, anything. The incident was so shocking and so unexpected that, that even government officials and experts were so, was so confused, even though the past 14 years after the incident. Four days after that, on December 10th, geologists from Sydney conclude that it was simply a meteorite of the size of a golf ball made of a combination of soft granite and sediments, the responsible of the catastrophe. Following this assumption, the mystery was suddenly called off, much to the outrage of many people, who to this day still is not convinced that a mere meteorite made of sedimentary rock was the responsible of everything. As a matter of fact, the AUFORN or Australian UFO Research Network claimed that authorities this means a potential key witness of this incident. For those who are wondering if there's any UFO related mysteries in Australia, here is your answer. Ladies and gentlemen, the Guira Dam incident of 1999. From a point of view, I think it's marvelous. All of us know about the two movies of Wolf Creek, which takes place in the outback one of the biggest and longest landscapes in the entire world. And even though these movies are partially fiction and based on reality, it makes you feel that we are living the same outback, an adventure like any other, in flesh and blood. A sensation that not even movies, western, eastern, fiction or real life based fantasy of horror can inspire. And Wolf Creek, like I said, is a combination of both reality and fiction. These three stories are 100% real and, like I said before, are a small part of the three anecdotes of Australia. Too much for the imagination, right? Australia is still trying to recover some traits of the past, and although all of these stories have little to do with our regional tradition, it's a signal of the many anecdotes that we will find in Australia. If these stories happen after the, com after the colonization of 1788, just imagine the many stories that could exist even before that. My objective is to find some, some of these stories and share them with you as much as possible. I am Hainitos and I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed to make it and research it. Thank you very much.